in and gave them guns. What we were looking at was one specific area where we could find anything that possibly either a teacher or a student could use. And the really great thing, and I'll show it to you in just a second, about this is it broke it down into areas that was easy for either us as teachers to find or as students to find if we sent them their general defense. So it breaks it down into opportunity types, um, a actual type of assignment. So is it a lesson, an activity, a lab? Is it a full unit? Is it a digital lesson? Grade levels, and then it even breaks it even further into subject areas. So when I click on this actual link, okay, this is the main page that this is, that it takes you to. And if you notice, it says Mass Assembly Engagement, Browse for Topics, and then it does Students and Educators. Um, they actually update this site almost monthly. So like last month, the main thing they were advertising were lessons and activities that you could do in your classroom that would track around Halloween or October or fall. So I really like that, that it kind of engages your kids in whatever they're interested during that month. So like for December, and I could be wrong, but I'm betting they will probably have something up that's Christmas oriented. Now, when you go in and click on this, okay, so if I go to students first, um, here's where your opportunities, grade levels, types, and subjects are. I'm not gonna get as into detail on this one, but here's what I will say when I looked at this. The opportunity side of this is what I thought was really, really cool. So. I don't know if you guys have those one or two kids who are just, they're up here. So you're constantly trying to find a way to challenge that kid, or they're constantly coming to you at the end of class, end of the day, it's just as how can I expand on this? Every year I get one or two kids that they just, they want to take it that step further. That opportunities list, so they've got online things they can do, they've got in-person things they can do, um, they've got contests and challenges that they can enter in, so like one really unique one that I found, <coughs> that I'm actually giving to one of my kids who's a really good artist is actually send your art up in space. So that's actually an opportunity that they will be working on at home using this. Now for educators, ours looks about the same. I need to scroll down here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> I'm used to my computer. So when I go to this page, there we go. When I go to this page here is where I can break it down a little bit further. So if I go to grade level, you can see that I've got K to four, five to eight, nine to 12, higher education and formal education. Then it breaks it down into opportunities. Now for us, the opportunities are broken down into two things. So like they have professional developments for teachers that we can do. They have extended learning that we can do. And then for us, it also shows everything that the students can do. So like you have that main student drop down that I would send my kids to, hey, find something fun you might wanna do at home. Or here where I might wanna look and see, okay, what's something extra I might want them to do in class. From there, this is also broken down into subject types. And I will tell you guys, this right here has been my biggest hitch when it comes to other teachers in my building. Okay, so I can pull this up and say, okay, well this actually pertain, uh, pertains to history or this pertains to them, you can incorporate this here, okay? So they can find all of those things that can incorporate into their class instead of just science. Because all too often you say a NASA tool and every teacher in your building is gonna think, well, that's just something used in the science classroom. I can't use it anywhere else. Further down here into types. Okay, so when you're looking at types, this breaks you down into your hands-on activities, you've got images, play and learn, mobile apps, which is really cool. My son started playing with those. Read about it, your STEM lessons, <coughs> stuff like that. The one that we mainly focused on with our kids, because we wanted to pick one of those to show you guys that we just really liked. And the main thing that we focused on up here in the search bar was toolkits. Okay. So if you just search toolkits, so like it gives you all of these. So what the actual kit is about. And then the one that I chose just as a breakdown was a climate science toolkit. So I go here, click on the link, and that takes me to this page, which provides me all of the featured things. So these are the ones that they're really projecting out to you as educators, and then further breaking down. So your elementary educators who are struggling in teaching climate at school, because trust me, 
I fully know that some of them struggle on how do they incorporate that and teach their kids to read? How do they incorporate that and teach multiplication? Okay, it also breaks us up into our five through eight lessons, our nine through 12, and then you even have like your student-led activities, which I thought was really cool. That could be for your kids if you're wanting to do more of an extended assignment for your higher level kids. Now, I'm going to come back to this, guys, and I know that some of you who, who be already a Jan uh, good Lord, John Antonetti be. Guys, this was like the most favorite thing that I had from John Antonetti. Okay, so I took that, and then I broke it down into some basic questions when I went off at home by myself to look at it and say, okay, what question can I ask myself before I start looking at that? So for academic engagement, what strategies will be required in my students' work? What specifically am I asking them to do? Um, intellectual engagement, what will you have the students do? So they're using that higher level of thinking and then that egocentric engagement. So what engaging qualities will make the students want to do their work? So not just me wanting them to do it and not them constantly raising their hand and saying, but why do I have to learn this? Okay, you definitely wanna have that last part so they're not constantly asking that question. So this is a sample activity from the climate change. And all I did was take a picture from one of the climate ones from the five through eight. And this picture is actually from the My Math Today, which shows you an image of color scale for um, land coverage. And that's natural land coverage. Now, here's what I really, really like about this. Okay. If I'm starting out climate, and guys, I'm not gonna lie, I have struggled every year to engage students at the very beginning of climate as to why this could pertain to them or why climate is engaging. Now don't mean at the end when we do our then meal because yeah, they're all engaged then, but how do I engage them at the beginning? Okay, so if I throw this picture up on my board and I ask them, okay, if this is land coverage, okay, this is natural land coverage, where do you think, what colors do you think represent the most land coverage based on any other map, colored map that you have ever seen? Because this has no numbers on it. Just based on other maps that you know, other maps that you've seen, what colors would you assume are gonna be the highest land coverage? Now, for my mind, I don't know if this is where y'all's mind goes, but for my mind, I go to a climate map. Like I go to that winter polar report where you're looking in for snow and ice, okay? And when I look at that map, my higher numbers are always in the reds and my lower numbers start going into the blues and whites. I would like that to be where my kids go, but they don't have to be there yet. They don't have to be there yet, okay? So if I give this to them and I say, okay, what colors are your highest land coverage? What parts of the key could that be? Because guys, I've seriously had to start using this in my room to make my beginning lessons engaging. Not my projects, because those are great. It's always the beginning that I struggle with. And when I look at that, to me, that's identifying similarities and differences. Okay, so similarities between other maps that they have already seen. That's generating and testing a hypothesis. So they looked at it and they generated a hypothesis on what color was the highest land coverage based on what they know prior. They have personal response. They have choice in how they answer. This is also an evaluation of a map and analysis. Okay, so if I was to take this, because I still don't feel like this is where it needs to be, if I was to take this, and you don't have to say anything, because I'm not going to make y'all talk out right now, but if I was to take this, how could I take this activity and take it one step further? How could I incorporate more than just this picture? Because that really is a question. That's a question that every teacher asks themselves on every single day. How can I take this and push my kids just a little bit further? How can I engage them a little bit more? Well, what if I gave them a blank map and just gave them numbers and then allowed them to use whatever colors they wanted? Could that take me that step further and then come back and have them look at this? All right, so Sarah teaches at the middle school and I teach at the high school and in Edmonton County they're connected. So it made for a really great um, way for us to apply our <coughs> So the kids that I teach, I teach special education and science classroom, but I'm also certified five through nine science. So what they did this year was they took the kids that they're like, they're gonna drown, basically. 
Dixon in a classroom of 30 students. They're special education students. They need a smaller group. They need um, instruction at a slower pace to more engaging. So that's what I have in my science classroom. And the thing I loved about the toolkits was I could pull in some of those K through two activities and make it not look babyish because the kids in my class are tired of just looking at the baby assignments. So I had to make it look more grown up. I was able to take that toolkit and kind of use those lower assign, like lower grade resources to give them the background knowledge that they're missing and then try to get them to where they needed to be with the high school standard. So Sarah worked with them on the middle school standard of it. I worked with them on the high school standards and also applied that background knowledge. That's why the toolkits were so great for us to use. So then we went to that training this summer and we were like, hey, we love this. So our goal was to take these lessons and hit each side of the cube. And by the time we're finished with the unit, We've covered the cube, we've used our NASA tools, we've given them the background knowledge, and we've taught that standard effectively. So this is like the planning part of it. This is my next unit that I began. So the one that we did for the project was the life cycle of a star and the sun and things like that. Did you hear the back? Sorry. Yeah. But this, uh-oh, it says we shall not pass. <laughs> so this is instead like I wanted to show you all what it looks like at the beginning planning and then we'll go through and show what it looks like at the end. <coughs> okay, and so um thank you, friend. So this is we're we're learning about chemistry and we're learning about uh the properties of matter, physical and chemical properties. The problem is typically in a ninth grade science classroom, students have already learned what protons, neutrons, and electrons are, right? The students in my classroom have been taught that, but they don't remember it. And that's okay, it's just I'm gonna use these resources to kind of give them that background knowledge. So, I am extremely visual. It is something I know about myself. So what I would do is, I would come up with the things that I knew they needed, and I would start with that. Like, I know they need to learn electron shells and Lewis structure. I don't know how I'm going to teach it yet, but I know they need to know that. So then, I also know that they need to know those chemical and physical changes. They need to be able to create that Bohr model. Um, but I know that my students are going to need to only create three atoms instead of maybe 18, which is what you typically would ask, right? So I'm going to highlight that in yellow, and then I'm going to go up to the cube. And I'm going to say, you know what, that's novelty and variety. That's where I'm at on this one. It's also a non-linguistic representation. There I am. So here's where the, if you want to look at that, the rigor divide worksheet, I want to cross that rigor divide because it's as important with these students as it is with every other student in the classroom to cross that rigor divide. So my original thought was, I'm going to just have them each make three models, and then we're good. They learned, you know, they've had to show their protons, their neutrons, their electrons they've had to learn that it has the same amount of protons as electrons, and that you have to use the mass to determine how many neutrons. So I thought that would be great. Well, then I pull up this sheet, and I'm like, wait a sec, I can't cross the rigor divide with just them creating those models. So instead, I thought, you know what, if I do compare and contrast by trait, once they've created their models, then I can display them, everybody's models in front of everyone, and say, how can we sort these? And so instead of telling my kids, hey, this is in this column on the periodic table because it only has three electrons on that valence electron, that outer shell, it only has three valence electrons. They're gonna look at it and they're gonna say, wait a sec, these can go in the same group together because they have three on the outer shell. Is it gonna take like 30 minutes of conversation about all the other traits that they're writing on the board? Absolutely. But I feel like it's gonna be more knowledgeable or like it's going to be more remembered for them. And in my opinion, that's how I can cross the rigor divide with that activity. So that's what we kind of started doing was, not only were we trying to get all the areas of the cube to finish up our lesson plan, our unit, but we also wanted to cross the rigor divide. And so that's how we use that. My kids loved the sun as a star lesson so much. I had a kid in my 
101 died, and we got towards the end of it when they were building. And I'll show you that one here in a minute. They came in, and this kid, they weren't finishing the work. So before I could even start with the students in my class, I was having to get them started on their assignments and show them where they're at. I looked up, and my kids that have always hated school and hate every assignment and complain about every assignment had already plugged up my hot glue guns and were already working on their designs very quietly doing what they were supposed to be doing. And I thought, okay, that's how you know it's successful. When this group of students who will dodge your eyesight, do whatever they can to get out of assignments, not only do they go in and get started right away, they're like, oh, she's busy, I'm gonna plug up the hot glue guns, I'm gonna get my projects out, and I'm gonna begin. And so after that, I was like, okay, I will be using this for every unit that we cover because it truly made it engaging for my students. So, with the sun as a star, we worked on how the life cycle of a star and where our sun's at in that life cycle. Then we talked about nuclear fusion, which honestly, before I started this, I thought, nuclear fusion? I don't know how I'm gonna get through nuclear fusion with this group of students right here. By the time we were finished, I was like, this worked, I'm thrilled to death with it. So we started with a KWL chart, and that resource is linked in there, and it was in the toolkit. <coughs> I pulled probably three lessons out of this. Do you care if I scroll down here? Thank you, honey. Yeah. Oh, put back up one more. Right here. So I'm almost certain it was activities one, two, and three. I pulled from this. This is like a brief description of them, but it goes on down. You can get all of the resources, I think even some of it's scripted. I mean, it's it's a pretty handy little tool. So, if I'm looking at that, and I'm looking at the engagement cue, and I'm looking at the activity one, yeah, can you just go ahead? Can you go back? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. And it's a KWL chart. So, the engaging qualities of work, where do you think that that would fall on the cue? But if you don't want to answer out, that's fine. But if you do, uh, we can, Pull it up here, and you know what? It's okay if you think it's different than what I thought it was. But if I'm looking at it, I think it is. It's fine. Personal response. We did a KWL on just what they knew about the sun. And you know, at the beginning, it was just kind of like it's yellow, it's hot, it's where we get our warmth, things like that. What you want to know, they wanted to know a lot of things. They wanted to know. You know, how hot could it get? Things like that. That was also summarizing and note taking. And it was application. We made our personal, we personalized it, we made unique decisions about the content whenever we decided what we wanted to learn. Okay, so then the second activity, we created these spectroscopes. And that was in the Sun as a Star thing. It was really neat. At the end of it, they have got these little templates where you can cut them out. I cut up pieces of a CD. We stuck it in there, and we made our own little spectroscopes, and we made observations, right? Yes, please. So, that was learning with others, that was novelty and variety, because they didn't even know what it was until we started that lesson. They didn't even know why people used that. It was a non-linguistic representation, and we said it was procedures with connections, and we had real examples, because we looked at real STEM scientists that use those. And so then this, we use, um, it's a Chandra activity. I printed it off like this. My kids have scientific notebooks. And we glued these down as they were flaps. And then, descriptions, thank you. We were able to click on each of these descriptions. That one's not a great one. I mean, the whole description is just the explaining part. Can you care to click on one that's got more to it? I really liked it it gave information about it. It told what it was. Now, my students were not able to read this, but I read this to them, and they were very interested. And then, yeah. And then we went through our own life cycle notes. And I just got this off of Teachers Pay Teachers. But sometimes it helps. And we went through how it was different if it was an average size star and if it was a massive star. And that also went into um, their notebooks, just because my students do very well with pictures and multiple representations of the same thing. So, that was learning with others, advanced questions, cues, and organizers, which they are reproduced the accepted meaning. So, does anybody have any suggestions looking at the record about how can we 
meeting had taken any of these because I didn't really cost her the time so much I would like to have received. Do they have? Parks and 
recreation project or parks and recreation. You could write a letter telling them ways that they could shield the children, the things that they could use. You're going to include your diagram, or you could create an infographic poster for them telling them ways that they could walk those UV rays. <coughs> so then, would you like to share this? Mm -hmm. okay. So this is them. This is my class and Sarah's class. That's their spectrograph. Um, here's the design. Like I said, I have a small classroom, and we might use paper boxes to, to hold our uh, hot glue guns. But anyways, this is them when they're just like going in there, they're plating them up, they're getting to work. They're doing their designing, they're building their things. And so here they are after we went out and tested them. Some of their beads turned up a light color. You know, some of them, their beads did not turn at all. And so then we took that back in the room. We talked about what blocked the UV rays better. And then that's when they made their, everybody in my class chose to make the infographic to send to the parks and rec about what blocks the UV rays, what they should put in their buildings that they're gonna put at the parks and recreation. All right. Okay, so before you guys get into this, um, that activity that we just did, here's what I truly liked about those school kids. You could take that one lesson and with everything that they gave you, you could take it up to high school or you can even take that down to elementary school. Like, my middle schoolers had the funnest time with those UV beads because essentially they got pipe cleaner and they created animals that they were gonna shelter. Don't get me wrong, my kids in my seventh period were not as creative as hers because one of them created a bunny, I think. One of hers created yes, a bunny. Yes, they were all in, they, they were all in. They watched YouTube tutorials to make the best one. <laughs> but like, you can take that and modify it all the way down to your elementary school kids based on the resources that that one toolkit gave you, which kind of shows your elementary school teachers, you know, hey, yes, I can do this. I can incorporate this in my room. Or it can go all the way up to your high school kids who need that extra little bit of push. Now, one of my favorite things about anything when it comes to having to do UV is being able to go and play quickly. Because that is where I learned. I like seeing what other people did with it. I like knowing how to get through the tool itself. But then what I really enjoy is being able to go in and work with it myself for a minute. So what I did is I created a jam board. If I can click on this guy, there we go. And you guys have access to this. So essentially what you want to do, and there's 20 total slides, there's not 20 people in here. So pick a slide and then pick an activity that you might want to use state what your grade level is because essentially every teacher in this classroom gets this jam board so you may see something that they didn't see you may see something that you find more engaging to a certain grade level that could apply to someone at another table that they can go and take back to their classroom if you're like me and you like to write on it before you type on it i'm going to bring another one of these around so that you can kind of map it out because we have plenty <laughs> and so you're going to go through and pick a nice tool kit yes. and map out a way that you can hit all three sides of the cube and cross the river divide on a lesson, on part of that lesson. Yeah. So while you're doing this, questions to consider um, what your grade level and content that you teach, because that can apply to other people in this room. Um, how you may use this resource in your room, because that's always helping when a teacher is looking something up. Whenever we go to Teachers Pay Teachers, we all go down to that description that says, how this is used in the room. How does this apply to me? And then how does this resource work with the engagement too? So we want something we know that's going to engage our kids, not something that's just another tool that we're just gonna throw to the side and never use. 